Today's topic is our top five favorite JDM importable cars. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Smoking Tire Podcast. This episode is brought to you by Off The Record. They've been a longtime sponsor, but we need you guys to know that they have a brand new code. So whether you're starting with Off The Record from scratch or just updating the Off The Record app that you've already downloaded, make sure you get that new code. That's, that's TST pod code tst pod on the off the record app the url is still the same off the record.com slash tst and if you're here for the first time and you're going matt what is off the record well i'll just tell you it's a service that helps you fight tickets you don't want to plead guilty to a ticket ever it doesn't matter if you did it or not it doesn't matter how bs it feels it doesn't matter how bad you want to just get on with your life getting on with your life is easy with off the record all you do is make an account at off the record.com tst download the off the record app use code TST pod, snap a photo or a scan of that ticket, and off the record will assign a qualified attorney in that jurisdiction to fight that ticket on your behalf. You don't have to do anything else. They have a great success rate. And if OTR doesn't get those points off your record, you don't pay. It is a fantastic system they've got going on over there. I've used it personally. It has helped me immensely keep my driver's license and my insurance rates where they need to be. Offtherecord.com slash TST or code TST10 on the Off The Record app. All right, on this show, it's a crew show, and me and Zach are talking about our top five favorite JDM cars. January 2024, the GTR R34, the last great Japanese car that you couldn't get in America, is now eligible for import, and we're talking about that and our other favorite JDM cars of all time. Plus, I'm getting a $3,000 paint correction on my cheap Bentley Turbo R. Uh, Zach and his fiance Sarah have some adventures with some Turos and are headlights getting brighter or is it just me? All this and more on today's crew show. Welcome to the Smoking Tire Podcast. Uh, welcome to the crew show. It's the crew show. We're talking about things, talking about cars. Atmospheric river today. The river is coming from the oh, sky. It's an atmospheric river. Is that's why it's raining. That's why it's raining so much. No. Oh. It's an atmospheric river. There was a three inch puddle in our carport. I had to change socks after oh, uh, no. adding air to Sarah's Turo. Like, what did she Turo this week? Mustang GT Premium. Oh, interesting. Steering. I drove it last night and a, I, the a steering. New, uh, not, box, a do- not a new one, an old one, right? A couple years old? Three years old. Yeah. But like the steering felt weird off center. Mm-hmm. And I went, what's going on here? And I thought the I thought the tires were down 20 PSI. Yeah. They were down five. So I just think the steering box is toast. Oh, maybe. Yeah. It also <laughs> has like oil change light. The person who owns this doesn't care. How many miles are on 33, it? 33,000. Oh, it should be. It should be okay. I might it's be not... wrong about the steering box, but on, on center, it was really light, loosey-goosey steering. Uh-huh. And as soon as you put five degrees in, it gets really heavy. Oh, it's E-Pass though. Yeah. It's, it, and it's did you isn't there a mode? There's like a different steering weight mode. There is like but it was just in, it was in normal. It didn't huh. feel like didn't feel sport right mode in bla, in uh, hmm. dark horse or anything. Well, it probably wouldn't. But but also the back windows are stuck about five percent down. The motors are kind of broken or something. Down. Yeah. The back windows go well, down. Well, it's a convertible. Oh, so, you have, so it so it has oh, those little quarter the windows. Little corner windows. And they're open a little bit. Oh, and boy. we told the person there, and they said, "Oh, it'll be fine." And we said, "It is raining," <laughs> and, is, and we documented it. This is not our problem. Oh no! Yeah, it, it wasn't <laughs> wet inside, but so she's not going to be getting a Mustang. Oh, she she doesn't want one anyway. Yeah, but she wanted to have the V8 experience. It's a funny thing that she's doing. I, it's such a great Did idea. Did we actually talk about we what haven't. she's doing? I think we should because it's sure. funny. So, so, so she had a she had a little whoopsie in her Honda Fit, her yeah. trusty Honda Fit. She owned a Honda Fit for ten years, bought it brand new, had a whoopsie. Uh, a van in front of her slammed on their brakes unexpectedly. The van driver, driving a budget van, was had no driver's license, no insurance. And the only identification card they had was not from this country. Oh, so I cool. think so. Someone rented it and gave it to them. Yeah. Um, 
That's good. So that was well, yeah. I mean, that wasn't great. It doesn't really impact her like their case at all. Yeah. There, so far, there's been no no one's reporting their neck hurts or anything. I mean, they didn't even like feel the hit because in the but the fit was destroyed. <laughs> yeah. The fit ran into a metal bumper, and the bumper was radiator height, not bumper height. So, so Sarah, we went car shopping, and uh, as we've talked about, we went with hybrid. Yeah. You know, we've talked. You and I have talked about a lot EV versus hybrid. And plug-in versus not. And where we landed after analyzing Honda CRV hybrid, RAV4 hybrid, checked out the Subaru briefly, is um, RAV4 hybrid, non-plug-in. Okay. Yeah. And it's it's amazing. I watched Alex on Auto's videos. Shout out to Alex because his shit is super detailed for consumer advice with these things. And the real-world testing of the CRV hybrid is like five miles per gallon below what EPA estimates are. Oh, really? Which so why do you th- why is it so so different? Um, the, he he's not sure actually, and the new one has a two-speed transmission, kind of mm-hmm. like the Taycan does, to try to help that. But the Rav Four delivers as advertised. Okay, so it's a pretty significant difference. So she's she's or, bought one of those, ordered it, but we have like a month and a half till that arrives. So in the meantime, what you, the reason you brought this up is she's doing like a buffet thing, like she's just turrowing a different car a week and having. These different and it's car specifically cars that she doesn't want to buy. Correct. Yeah. But cars or she wouldn't, likes. Or wouldn't buy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like, she doesn't want a, a Mustang V8 right now because yeah. mileage, commuting, etc. But she loves that, yeah. Shelby's. And I was like, well, you can't. We can't turn a Shelby. They're not out there. But... This you could get you could get a plus. Hertz, the Hertz Shelby. Someone also actually was turning a GT500, which is... A new one? Wi- yeah. <laughs> I mean, wild. Some people are renting... Serious power for yeah. not that much money. Yeah. I don't understand how they think that will work out with the tire budget. I mean, it, it they won't. There's There are people that operate many businesses of many different types that are very bad at math. Yeah. I mean, and there's also, if you, I suppose there's an argument where if you, if you want a GT500 for yourself, you go, okay, well, so this is 1500 bucks a month, but I could turrow it for 300 a day. And if it goes out five days a month, true. you know, then I can drive it for the other. I, I kind of understand I that, that math. That's true. But, and then I think there's probably some type of tax thing. If you're operating a Turo fleet or a Turo business, that may be a business asset. So Mm -hmm. it may be a pre, if you start an LLC, that may be a business asset. So you're paying pre-tax, assuming you work a regular job as opposed to a post-tax. So like there's some kind of math there, but like, man, the odds of that car being crashed are really high. And the odds of that car being abused are really high. And the odds of going through very expensive tires are really high. Yeah. I mean, because the people that, a lot of the people that would rent that car, they're either going to be in their 50s and they like the GT500 Mm -hmm. or they're going to be 28 and they just got approved on Turo and they're like, let's have an amazing night. Yeah. So. Or both. Or, you know, or deaf or both somewhere in between. But like. That I'm not necessarily saying that all that math is bad, but it could be very bad math, or it could be someone that doesn't really care and and is doing some creative math to justify half a month with a GT500, you know. It's a good point. If you if you can only afford 700 bucks a month and you can make 700 on Turo, now you have a GT500. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, this is Los Angeles, where. Mm-hmm. You know, everyone's financed to the gills. Everyone's financed up, and like, you know, if you have a GT five hundred, some of the time, <laughs> all you need it is on Friday night. Yeah, you, you know? only need it some of the time. You don't need it all the time. People aren't coming over to your house and going, "Hey, where's the GT five hundred? You've true. brought it to an event, or oh, I brought this my other car today, or whatever." It's a good point. That's yeah, actually, no one, no one sees your house. For this idea. No one sees your house in LA. They only ever see your car. Uh, true. Or you, well, or you park it in your apartment and then you invite them over, but they take a lift to your apartment. They don't see the they don't, garage. They don't see it. It's all smoke and mirrors. Yeah. That's why everyone in this town drives a Range Rover and then lives in like a fucking shitty crib. That yeah, happens that like all the frequent, time. Yeah. I, I, you drive around the city and you just see that all the time. You see Range Rovers and Huracans and like what, like dope cars parked at like relatively garbage apartments. Mm-hmm. It's all the time because no one ever comes over. You're always meeting people yeah. somewhere. Your car is, and, and we spend a lot of time in our car here. Yeah, 
Uh, it's, it's the identifier. Yeah. Would yeah. you rather have a nice car or a nice house? Nice house. I'd rather have a nice house too if I had to choose. A, but but like. But I think we only learn this because of our job and driving mm -hmm. things, and eventually you get to that point. Because mm -hmm. if I spent, some people commute, you know, an hour and a half a day, and you go, I'm going to treat myself. Sure. And, I, and the, or this makes me feel a certain way. Blah blah blah. But I think it sneaks up on people, and before you know it, you're spending mortgage money on a car. I see how you could fall money. into the trap. Mm -hmm. I'm not necessarily shitting on that lifestyle. If you have a long commute and no one ever comes over and you live by yourself, I'd, I'd have a nice car in a crappy apartment with a nice bed. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, yeah. that's, that's, that's fine. Like, I'd rather, if I'm spending three hours a day commuting, I'd rather it was in a nice car because I'm living in that bitch practically. But I think... That slippery slippery slope is. It wouldn't be a Huracan. Like, it would be. I could see Range Rover or Mercedes. Like I wouldn't. It, you know, I wouldn't have like a nice sports car, fun car, no, and live it's in a shitty place. Yeah. Uh, you know, Sarah's getting a pretty optioned up Rav Four hybrid, and it's it's not cheap. It's like forty four thousand dollars or forty two thousand dollars, but. To get into the first, to get a base Lexus hybrid, you yeah. start at like 62. Yeah. So if you want a nice thing that commutes and has these attributes, yeah. you can get the Toyota version or the Lexus version. That's, you know? yeah, there's definitely an argument for that. So if, if it was just commuting, I feel like you can find comfort and accessories mm -hmm. cheaper than a Mercedes. Now, definitely. Mercedes That's where amazing, Acura but, comes in. But yes. That yeah. is the land of Acura. Mm -hmm. That's the perfect car for a long commute. An Acura crossover, RDX or MDX, excellent. Yeah. That's that's where it's at. So those seats and that stereo. Seats are so good. It's all you need. Yeah. That would be a great car for a place that doesn't have charging infrastructure or you're not doing stop and go a lot. Right. You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so anyway, we so she's turrowing things that yes. she so she she's got this Mustang GT convertible that's fairly janky right yeah, now. But it's got the noise yeah. because last week she turrowed a Sublime V6 Charger. And she, well, Sublime she, is the name of the color. color, not the emotion you feel when driving, <laughs> or uh, the band you listen to while driving. That's true. Um, that's not really a, a Sublime kind of car. Mm -mm. Um, she honestly rented it because she liked the color, but I, we looked for a Charger 392 or something, and they weren't out there, strangely. They've all been crashed. Well, it's V6 or Hellcat. And that's I, very funny. Yeah. It's, it's, that's the market. Okay, so the market is the aesthetic or, you know, the alternate alternative to, like, going to Hertz to get a base yep, charger. Under, undercut Hertz or Hellcat. Yep. How funny. There is there's this – the market of that on Turo is do you want a rental car? Or do you want a special experience mm -hmm. that you can't afford? Mm -hmm. And so, and this person was renting this, like, literally a golf shot from LAX. Yeah. So they're directly competing with Hertz. Yeah. But, you know, it was, she's like, this thing cruises great, the stereo is good, but it doesn't have the sound. And I was like, then let's rent a, v a Mustang. Let's yeah. find a Mustang GT. So is that all she's gotten so far, those two? Or is there uh, something else in the list? What was the week before that? Oh, she she turned a Rav Four Prime oh. to try before you buy. Oh, okay, yeah. And so that was like a good confirmation. So yeah, yeah it was that one, this, that, and then um, I forget. She hasn't picked one for next week yet. I mm. thought she should rent a Mini. Go the opposite I way. I think that a Mini would be fun. Something tiny yeah. and fun for a little bit. That could be fun. Yeah. Or she doesn't. She doesn't. She can drive stick, but prefers not to. Right. She doesn't want to drive stick. Yeah, she's not. That practiced in yeah. it. She can, but I think she, she wouldn't feel comfortable. Hmm. A mini, I think, would be a, that could be a fun one, even if it was like a countryman. That could still be okay. Uh, yes, but, but like a or a convertible, maybe mini convertible if the weather's cooperating. Oh man, poor bastard. Speaking of which, um, you know, at West Side Collector Car Storage, we manage the press fleet for Morgan for the Super Threes, um, and poor Mike Van Runkle came to collect the Super Three yesterday for a press loan. It's just fucking pissing rain ever since. This, I don't know where he's got this thing parked, but yeah, it sucks. just pawn on the cover and just, just sits there. Garbage. Yeah, that yeah. sucks. Um, oh. Man, I think yeah, Mini would be would probably be a good one for her. What else would be like? I mean, she might also maybe like a BRZ or something even to try like like an agile sports car. That's true. That's a uh, that's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah, and that's got the nice automatic transmission. It's yeah. Good enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Surprisingly good automatic on the BRZ. Uh, right. Yeah. I mean, even back when we drove the first one, first gen, shocked by yeah. how quickly the paddles, uh, the engine yeah. responded. Why is that automatic so much better than other automatics? It's a, I, I don't get it. It's I a guess very they put the good, work in. very good automatic in yeah. that car. 
How interesting. So anyway, that's the Turo Buffet. So yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's uh, she should find an empty parking lot and fucking Dorifto this convertible. <laughs> I told her not to do that. Yeah. <laughs> it started raining and she sent like the emoji like giant eyes and I said yeah. no. What are the don't. odds that these Turo cars have the appropriate specification tires on them? I think this car has two different tires like front and rear. Yeah. And today they looked really low. Yeah. Uh, they were only like six pounds low but um, <laughs> they look old. We uh, were, uh, well, we saw the uh, the everyday driver boys in the canyons, and they had turroed that Fiat 124 yeah. that was like beat and had lion heart tires on it. I'm like, oh boy, mm -hmm. <laughs> here we go. If you see that lion, I saw a fucking, you know, you know where I live, there's, uh, it's sort of on the edge of, of good neighborhood and sort of not so great neighborhood. And so what we see is a lot of early low spec Panameras rolling uh, right. around bunch of them and uh someone rolled up next to me at the gas station the other day and it was like a v6 panamera with the big wheels on it like they weren't the aftermarket wheels but like they were like the panamera turbo so they wheels got base engine base but they engine got max but wheels. It, max wheels lion hearts on there and i was like oof the the germans would not would not approve of this spec tire on this fucking thing probably yeah when like, you see the badge just says panamera and there's no nothing after that right and, yeah. yeah i mean there's nothing wrong with the v6 panamera if you want the comfort and the space and don't care but like when it's that the turbo appearance package and then the cheap tires you go oof, i see your priorities Clearly I mean, you know, here. But on the other hand, if you're in L.A., most of the time you're going slowly. So, like, you don't need the bigger engine. We sure. enjoy it because we go to the canyons. Sure. So it, Yeah, I mean, I, I I wouldn't get a Panamera with the small engine because it's that's not the experience that I'd want to have for that much money. Right. But, like, I kind I you know, I kind of get it. I, I The Macan T was okay. That's, that's when small engine was all right. Good oh, handling. Yeah. That was yeah, okay. That was okay. But a Panamera is a big car. I mean, a 300 horsepower V6 in a yep. Panamera, that's going to feel slow. Well, also, that's when people run into, they get surprised by gas mileage in the city because yeah. the car is heavy. So yeah. they don't realize, oh, when you're up to speed and cruising, sure, the highway mileage is whatever, but yeah. you're moving 5,000, yeah. 4,800 pounds around. And yeah. Like it really stresses the engine. Yeah. That's why you need a 1991 Bentley Turbo R. No stress. That's, yeah. <laughs> no stress there. You want to throw that thing? The low. Oh man, no, no. That would be. That's a dangerous, yeah. dangerous game to play. Yesterday, we. It's mostly done. To took a three thousand dollar paint correction on the Bentley, Derek. Very interesting. So this this car has a single stage metallic paint. So normally single stage paints are not metallic because mm -hmm. um, they lay the flake. The over flake or is something over. Else. It's in. It's layered or it's in the clear or whatever. Right. So this is a metallic single stage, which is very uh, interesting. But whenever Derek works on a car, shout out to Derek uh, Bemis, Detail Works W E R K S on Instagram. He's probably the best paint polisher on the West Coast. He's basically like. He's like the West Coast version of Larry. They call him Mr. McGuire. What's his Instagram? Detail uh, work. It might be detail underscore W E R K S. Is that right? Yep, I got it. Is it underscore? Yes. Detail underscore W E R K S. They call him Mr. McGuire's because he was Barry McGuire's personal detailer for 25 years. Jeez. He's a OG, Ooh. this guy. And he's just, he's extremely hardcore when it comes to polishing and it's like, it's like being around Larry, Yeah, you know? Um, and in fact, that's how I met him. You know, it's like, if I like, he, they're on the same level of polishing. Derek's not like insane. Like, you know, Larry's fucking out of his mind. Derek's like a, a mellow, like California surfer guy right. who just happens to be very good at polishing cars. Um, but if you can't, you know, if you're on Larry the West has Coast, to clean the world. Yeah, Larry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And Larry, Larry and Larry's like you know crazy high strung, <laughs> and Derek is not. Yeah, uh, he's yeah. mellow. <laughs> yeah, he is. Yeah, he's, he's, flip, he's flip flops and shorts. Yeah, yeah. yeah. he's fucking mellow. Yeah. Um, yeah. he's like, yeah, he's literally polishing cars in flip flops. That's but he's the but it. he's the best in California, so he works for us here at Westside part time, and uh, so I have him on something of a retainer, <laughs> and so I was like. Okay, here we go. And you know, like a lot of cars that he works on, they look they look good to me until he starts working on them. And you go, and then you go, oh, mm -hmm. you know. And so, the, I thought that Bentley looked pretty good. And the video we made, like, it looks pretty good. 
Like it's not like you look at this and go, oh, this paint isn't good. No, it, it looks, looks yeah, it does. It great. Look good. It's it, good shape. But then he did the 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 line down the middle and the and you go, oh, well, that's that's not what good is. Good if, is when it was in the sun. Some parts you could see swirl, yeah, like yeah. old swirl sure. from polish washing yeah, and stuff. That's but otherwise, out. I mean, there were no nicks. There was it's really good shape. It is in generally very good shape, but it it's never been polished ever. I mean, it's never been machine polished, no. According, to, according to Derek, he said wow. there's no evidence of it being machine polished. Oh, cool. And he said at some point, it might have got sap or something on it because he said someone used kind of a solvent to clean it, some sort of, so, of solvent that, that left this sort of haze, these sort of almost like streaks in a window on parts of it, which he was able to polish off, and are, it's totally gone now. Um, and he, he did. He polished the chrome wheels, and he polished the fucking the veins in the grill Whoa. and the trip. Wait till you see it downstairs. But he he only had he had twelve hours yesterday, so he didn't do he didn't finish it. He has to, he now has to do another layer of finer polish and the ammo reflex the coating. It's like a pseudo ceramic coat. Um, he's coming back to do that. Now, fortunately, it's going to be pissing rain the whole time, so the car can just sit inside and wait. And I'm not a bitch about this car. I drove it through the rain for a week, but I'm not going to spend all this money on a fucking the world's greatest detail and then immediately drive into an atmospheric river. I need to enjoy something for like a couple of days. Well, it also isn't done getting all the coating. It right? needs to get the coating, that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. you don't want to drive in the rain half measure. He'd probably have to yeah. undo something. It would, he'd have yeah. to do extra work. It just caused, but, so we got other things to drive and whatever. But uh, <laughs> I don't know why I felt like this car needed this. <laughs> but I was like, you know what? Fuck it. Let's, let's, let's make it nice, nice. So where do you see it downstairs? Well, it's but after this, it's done. I mean, I think because yeah, you yeah. took it to Charlie Agapu and you yeah. said do everything. Yes. And now aesthetically, you can say do everything. Yeah. And then it's all right, totally done. You know, you like that's what you like to do with the car. Is like I like to get it, spy, get, get it, it back to perfect. Right. Just do it all, and then we drive. Yep. So we should do some kind of a uh, a little road trip in it because it's 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 quite delightful. Yeah. Man, after getting the other day, we filmed <clears throat> that the Morgan three wheeler. If we which, do the road trip plan. That's the oh, the podcast, the podcast road trip plan. Yeah, That's that, the car that would be it. G. <laughs> yeah, parking that, that'll get more uh, positive response than the Maki. Yeah, that would be pretty G. Okay. Um, but uh, getting from, you know, we did, we, we were at the, had the Morgan three wheeler, we've made this film, whatever. Uh, and we can talk about that later uh, once the video is done for next week. We'll talk about it in next week's show. But um, going from, I parked that back at, WCCS South Bay and got in the Bentley and man did my attitude just change immediately I just I got you know because that Morgan you want to like you want to like wind it out and it's like vibratey and buzzy and like it's a thing mm -hmm. it's a it's a thing and it's little yeah, and, and all this shit -kart brain. you're in yeah and then you get in the Bentley and you just like <sighs> and I think I was I, I caught myself smiling as I drove, as I cruised back home in the Bentley, I just caught myself in like a, like people can look in and just see me smiling while driving this car, which is not my resting face. It is not. To say. <laughs> not like great. I have a fucking scowl on all the time, but like, I was like, yeah. Like this. Yeah. Right. It was nice. Nice. This fucking car is so great. It's a it's, nice looking car. It's a car where... I don't feel any kind of need to like make a move or like get it. I, I fucking pick a lane, I'm in it, I'm cruising, you know, and like drive underhand. Mm -hmm. It's fantastic. Yeah, because that car's not great for lane switching, you know, constantly. It I mean, handles fine, but it it's does, not but like it's, a weaving yeah. through traffic so kind it, of it car. Puts you, you know, I'm not going to do that. There's no point. Puts it, you in it's a mindset. More work. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just going. I'm just cruising. It's so nice. It's so nice. And I, I drive a little slower in the city, too. I don't, like, accelerate hard from lights and then hit the brakes for the next light. I kind of time the lights a yeah. little better so I can just keep moving. Shit's great. I do that even in my car, and I think it's why I have, I'm still on the same clutch after 50,000, 60,000 miles. Yeah. Like, just minimize how many engagements there are. But you know where I don't do that? In the electric cars. The electric cars, I I smash the throttle, and then because of the one-pedal drive, you know, I time Ooh. it so I don't have to use the brakes. But, like... I'm, I'll beat everybody to the next light, and then I just end up sitting there longer. Oh, yeah. You and every Model 3 owner. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Everyone's racing. Oh, God. I, I mean, nobody—Model 3 drivers 
are the shit baggiest drivers. For a while, it was Model S drivers. Now it's definitely Model 3 drivers. I think it's because they're so cheap. It combines that used Altima vibe with instant torque. Just the craziest last minute moves, cut yeah. across four fucking lanes to get the exit ramp. I think that I think those people would have done that if their previous car could have given right. them performance and right. it didn't. Right. But they still did some shitty moves and now they're now superhuman they're... almost. Yeah. Yeah. I have been complaining a lot about Model 3 lights headlights on Twitter. And if someone works at Tesla, I wanna know if the if the headlights are aligned correctly when they leave the factory. Because sometimes a lot of the cars seem like lot to ask the left eye company. is just aiming at my head, like mm. upper left with the left light. And mm. I've seen some people responded on Twitter saying, my Model 3, the lights were misaligned. I had to change them or, you know, yes, they're fine or no, they're way too bright. And then the New York Times put out an article like last week saying that the complaints about headlight glare yeah. are at an all-time high. And I mean, in general, headlights... I, I, I sort of had chalked it up to just like getting old, but in general, like headlight glare at night bothers me now. Yeah, like, I thought it was an old eyes thing, and then I saw the New York Times report and other people younger than me reporting the same thing. I mean, we know headlights are brighter. Yeah, and and the technology has advanced a lot, but you know, I, and the auto high beam thing. Yeah, I see cars like BMWs a lot of times. All four lights are on, and it seems like their auto high beam shit is not working. You know when it was worse. For me, when I had the Raptor, or still when I drive tall uh, press cars, and I can see over the K-rail. Oh, like yeah. Like, when I drive, like, my Ferrari, for instance, and I'm low, and the K-rail blocks the oncoming, mm -hmm. it's actually much more... Uh, uh, it's better on my eyes. Right. If I'm driving something that's tall enough where the lights come over the K-rail for oncoming freeway traffic, it's fucking bad. That's funny because you're also probably blinding other people because your lights are going over yeah, the K-rail. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Oh, man, speaking of which, speaking of, speaking of the circle of garbage, here's a circle of garbage one. I have a friend who I will not name who drives like a seven-year-old Prius, okay? Person is not into cars. I know them tangentially through the neighborhood. His catalytic converter got stolen. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. It sucks. It happens. It sucks. A new, this, the, a, this Prius is worth, you know, $8,000, whatever. Yeah. It's probably more than seven years old. It's a, it's a second gen Prius. It's probably 10 years old at this point. Um, the car's not worth very much. They want $1,500 for the cat. So he gets a cat that is not like OEM from his car. I don't know where I don't know where it gets this cat. I suspect it was stolen from someone else's right. car. Yeah. <laughs> which did not occur to him that that's where this shady cheap cat is for like 300 bucks. So he goes uh, okay, so the engine is now quiet again. It has a cat. But because it's the wrong cat the check engine lights on and it won't pass smog. Yeah. <laughs> so this dude is now stuck with a Prius oh that won't pass smog. The, clean, the cleanest vehicle around. <laughs> and he's like, "What do I do?" And I go, I, "I go, I can't believe I'm saying this, but registered in Montana." I was like, "Someone asked a question about Montana." Today. I was we'll like, get to it. "I was like, honestly, like nobody, nobody will question a Montana registration in a little ten-year-old Prius." I was like, it's, "You're not cheating taxes. No one's going to suspect you of violating the Clean Air Act." Yeah, you owe and California State twelve. In your Prius, like I was like, I don't really know what else you could do. Like oh he's now because it, it's basically unsellable. Yep. You know, you 100%. can't just clear the check engine light. Like, who's going to go across state lines into California to buy a fucking this Prius? I was wow, like, circle oh. of garbage. And indeed. I was like, and oh, by the way, you probably bought somebody's stolen cat, dude. And yeah. he was like, oh, shit. And it may not be functioning <laughs> at the level. I mean, that's why the check engine light's on, because the mm -hmm. computer's not getting the information it needs. Yeah, it may right? not have the right sensor. I, you know, who the fuck knows? <laughs> Like, well, O2 sensor's not usually in the cat, so if it's before or after... Yeah, I don't it, know where they cut the pipe. It's Maybe they not cut... cleaning it the way the computer wants it to. Y yeah. Wow. <laughs> wow. That, my cousin is the same Prius. It got, his cat got stolen. He had to get one of those cages like, yeah. that covers it. Right? Yeah. So, like, you know, I don't... 
I mean, I can't That's believe. That's funny. I can't believe I I advised this dude to get it registered in Montana because, like, what else? Are you? And I was like, hope you like the car because it's yours forever now. Like, that is you, interesting. Your though. car like, is I guess basically a, a cat's unsellable. Not a cat, you know? Like, yeah. We, we know, I mean, I would have thought they're different sizes, but the material's similar. Yeah. So maybe they're more specific than that. Even if it's gas engine to gas engine. Yeah, they're they are yeah. not all the same. Uh, they're they're definitely not. <laughs> That sucks. That's pretty shitty. Shortcuts are shortcuts sometimes are not they good. Really fuck you. Yeah, I, I don't know what this person. The person may have said, "Oh, I'll, I'll put a cat back on there, three hundred bucks, whatever." Like, but it, and they did, and they they technically, technically did. They did. Yeah, but and then I and then my next <laughs> thought was like, "I'll give you two grand for it." <laughs> I'll fucking I'll fucking throw throw two grand at this thing to have a beater that can't be registered. I'll put my dealer plate on it. Fuck it. Oh shop God. shop beater in shop de- indeterminately. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that's a good point. If the guys need to run and get parts or something. Yeah, or like well, fucking whatever, dude. Shop shop beater. I, I bet he calls you in a year. As soon as that car needs to be re-registered, I bet he will be begging me to take it off of his hands. That you are in a very <laughs> unique situation, as is he. That's terrible. It's so funny though. It's stupid. I can't believe someone wanted fifteen hundred bucks for a new cat. Dude, that's it was yeah. I mean, I don't think. Well, I don't it. think you're buying used. I think you. Yeah. I think legally you have to buy a brand new one or size something. I don't know what the law says, but like when I had the Lexus LS four hundred, the mm-hmm. million mile Lexus, and we, I didn't realize that that was a forty nine state car in ninety six. It didn't have the California emissions package because it was sold in Florida. Uh, originally, and I had to get California cats put on it to fucking register it in California. It was two thousand dollars to get California cats. I paid twelve hundred for the car. It was so dumb. I mean, it wasn't dumb. I'm sure there's a rule for it, but it's it's uh, it's well, a yeah, thing. In California, no mm. person shall purchase a used catalytic converter, mm. including for the use of dismantling, recycling, smelting, except for a licensed dismantler. So I think it means even if you're a oh, car. so it's illegal to buy a catalytic converter used, even if you're buying the car to dismantle it. All right, folks, got to take one quick break because today's podcast is sponsored by Groove Life. Belts, wallets, EDC items, everyday carry, and more, but it's really the belt, man. It's the Groove belt. They've got that proprietary webbing engineered with just the right amount of stretch, and Groove Life has designed the coolest buckle. It snaps using rare earth magnets set in an aluminum alloy. No more holes. Magnets. Rare earth magnets. Trust me, your waist will thank you. It's easy to adjust Right, and the belt, the buckle includes this stuff they call stiff tech. That's a fancy way of saying there's no annoying belt flaps that need to be tucked in. Groove Life uh, is here for life, a 94 year no BS warranty, and the Groove Belt is the last belt you'll ever need. It will probably outlive you unless you like. I don't know, have a blood boy or you're listening to this as like a three year old and you live to a hundred, and even then, they'll they'll take care of you. They've grown from a side project to a company that now provides for over 100 families and been recognized by Inc. Magazine as one of the fastest growing companies in the USA. They make way more than just belts, wallets, rings, watch bands, AirPod cases, and a whole lot more. Throw your old belt away. You don't need it. Upgrade your belt game to Groove Life. Head over to GrooveLife.com slash Tire20. That's Tire20 for 20% off all Groove Life products. Products. That's the best offer you'll find, but you got to use my link in the show notes or go to GrooveLife.com slash Tire20 for 20% off your order. One last time, GrooveLife.com slash Tire20 for 20% off of your order. Thanks to Groove Life for sponsoring today's show, and now let's get back to it. Even if you are buying yeah even if you're buying the cat to dismantle it mm. unless you're an auto an, a licensed sure um dismantler, dismantler. Yeah. yeah so that's probably a law specifically to try to curb the theft of catalytic converters probably but there's clearly a black market yeah yeah obviously yeah, just getting stolen left and right for sure for the rare rare metals for sure <laughs> That dude, like, that dude is a hundred percent going to call me when he can't re, when he can't renew his registration. It's like if you had a Volt and the battery died, the big one, and then mm-hmm. someone went, well, "I'll put a Civic hybrid battery in it." Yeah, go, yeah sure. And yeah. then all the lights come on, <laughs> yeah. and you go, well, and it runs. But now, what do you do? Yeah, 
<laughs> yeah, but I foresee a Prius shop car coming coming soon. That's a mess. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so, should we talk about today's main topic? Yes, we should. So we're gonna try a thing, folks. If you've been listening to this show for the wi- a while, um, we basically have determined that uh, we should have a main topic. That it's worth it's worth it to 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 from a views perspective, from a discussion perspective, to not just talk about whatever's going on in in the world and ourselves, but to have an actual topic to cover for twenty minutes or so. Mm-hmm. On this podcast, and so Zach and I sat down and made a list of a hundred or so topics, and we're gonna crank through them all on this episode. No, no, we're doing <laughs> we're gonna do one, one. Let's go, <laughs> one per episode. You can you can chime in in the comments if you've got your own list, and and this one, this today's topic is inspired by the fact that uh, as of 2024. The R34 Skyline is legal for import in Japan. Uh, I'm currently in the middle of reading Ryan Zumalin's uh, book, Cult of GTR. Ryan will be on the show next week to talk about it. About halfway through that motherfucker right now. It's a good book. Uh, if you're interested in GTRs, there is a mention of the smoking tire in the uh, the book, which is very nice of Ryan to mention that. Um, but... Uh, our uh, our topic today is since the R34 is the the last cool uh, Japanese car that will, is really available for import. Everything that's just sort of great came before that. Mm-hmm. It's sort of the the end. I mean, there's this one. This is or, the finale. There's one or yeah. two here. Yes, this is the grand finale. So today's topic is our top five favorite JDM importable cars, and uh, I have a list. I have a list, and you have a list. Should we go back and forth, or should we? I don't. I have, we haven't looked at each other's lists. That's true. We haven't. So I'm hoping I avoided what I think are some obvious ones because I didn't want to overlap. Oh, Hope I did we'll not see. avoid obvious ones. I chose like, my I didn't actual put the R34 fi- on there because. Oh, I did. Yeah, I mean, I, I <laughs> like, of course, that one's one of the favorites. Like, well, yeah. So I just went. All right, I'm gonna try to find something else. Okay. But some you'll some you'll be familiar with. But let's do. Well, we can, we can start with the R34 GTR because uh, it's. it's the best. It, yeah, in my opinion, it's the best of those uh, uh, modern series of GTRs. Uh, yep. I, it's the fastest. I think it looks the best. It has the six-speed gearbox, which I love. It had far faster computing power than the R33. I think it was 100 yeah. times faster. Sure. Uh, no, 10 times faster than the R33 in terms of the yaw control, the diffs, all that stuff. Yeah, and it has the sort of PlayStation-inspired uh, computer screen on the top. It's uh, it's it's culturally very iconic. Of course. Um, it's the car that, at least for me, in the video games, uh, I forget which the first game was that had it that I played with, but it was like when we were racing each other, it was like no skylines yep. because it was so much fast. It, it seemed like a cheat. Like uh, like Bo Jackson in Tech Mobile, like you couldn't use Bo Jackson because he just was so much better than everybody. He was, and and then when I actually drove one, and I was like, oh shit, the video game wasn't exaggerating about this. Well, when the R thirty two came out and they started racing them, it just wiped the yeah. fucking floor. Yeah, I mean, if so you, this is the successor, of course. Yeah, I mean, I've I've owned a whole bunch of different cars from the late eighties, including an R thirty two, and if you consider the fact that the Countach, the three twenty eight. Uh, my Fox body, my 87 Safari 911, assuming it was stock, and the R32 were all for sale at the same time. It is a joke how much better the R32 is than all of those cars objectively. Mm-hmm. I mean, it is so much easier to go fast and so much faster than all of those other cars. Yeah. It's a, it's a fucking joke. Those other cars are all dinosaurs compared to the R32 Skyline. And the 34 is the evolved version of that. It's the 964 or the 993 of Skyline. It's yeah. the most refined, fastest, and best of that formula. I agree. Um, and, and it's... The 33 was bigger than the, 30, the 32, but it had a lot of the same computing power, and, and some people didn't like the size. But I think the 34, the exterior design works with the size. And then it also had all the updates. I mean, it's the most advanced one they had. Yeah. And obviously, like, it's fame in the movies. That's why it's seared in our brains, probably. Yeah. I've never been disappointed by one. No. I've only driven one, but it was fantastic. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I've driven four or five different ones, and they're all amazing. Yeah. Uh, nothing wrong with that car. It's absolute. It's going to be. It's already immensely collectible, and will only be 
uh, more collectible going forward. There's there's no way those cars are ever going to be affordable again. Even the shitty ones, like the shitty ones, are like a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. And anything. Let's we go to import a vehicle. Uh, Top rank, uh, heavily featured in Ryan Zumalin's book. Um, they've got they're they're they've got the you know probably the best ones that you can buy in America, and they are um, they're enormous money. I mean, they're just uh, is this their this is their featured inventory? Let's go to current. Uh, uh, sorry, I meant top rank, not import vehicle. Um, yeah, well, that's their website. Do we have R thirty fours on there? There are probably so there's probably none 32s. in inventory because every so single one 32s. is pre sold. These guys have been they've been selling them in Japan, and then you pay them to store them in Japan. And uh, there's not a one. Yeah, available. they don't have all the ones they have uh, are they're pre sold. They're yeah. all in Japan and they're pre sold. Wow. Um, there's a wait. There's like a, literally a waiting list for them, um, and they're all 150, 200 thousand dollars and and up for the for the decent ones. And if you, if it's a Nismo or a Z Tune or any of those, you know they're they could be up to three or four hundred thousand dollars. And I mean that's a interesting price point because now it's with new GT threes. Yeah. With you know, nine nine seven dot one or two GT yeah. threes. That's some really like uh, rare air. Yeah, and and to a, a a strong strong subset of people that is coming into money mm -hmm. and play use. This was the video game car. I mean, the, the and the the tunability and all that stuff, and is and also the the fact that they were not obtainable, and the fact that they're that that we've gone our whole lives without seeing them on the roads really is a big deal. Um, so there's people that could afford a GT3 and could afford a, uh, you know, a Huracan, but would rather have, you know, a Skyline. Yeah, totally. Uh, all right. What do you got? So my first one is, uh, Tommy Mackinnon Evo 6. Oh, okay. Yeah. So let me pull up, uh, Mitsubishi this. Evo 6. Yeah. Oh, look at that. Very few cars can fuck with white wheels, Very but few. an Evo, an Evo rally car. That'll do it. So I, you know, I know we got the Evos, the 8, 9, and 10 here, but this is, it's not where it began, obviously. This is the sixth generation, but this was the best one, in my opinion, that we didn't get until the 8s and 9s. And after this, the 7 got bigger. Mm -hmm. This is like a 4-inch longer car. Um, and this was to celebrate uh, Tommy's fourth, sixth consecutive WRC win. Ironically, when this car came out the next year, someone else won, I think, in Peugeot. Um, but... It's got the homologation. It's got the race pedigree. It has a uh, stronger internals and a better intercooler and better cooling than the street car. Uh, the RS they sold at the time had a quicker steering rack than the, quote, luxury GSR. Uh -huh. this got, so this had the good steering rack. It had different dampers. It was slightly lower. It had a little bit stronger engine. And, of course, it has the driver nod to it. So yeah. I just think these are so fun and raw and just such a good time. Um, and for me, this and, this and the Double X were like my magnets towards Japanese car market. Mm. Like, I think I saw, I was exposed to these before the R34 in movies. So I've always just been attracted to the rally stuff. And if I had to pick one versus STI, I'd go with this. Yeah. 22B, everybody loves. That's why I didn't yeah. put it on the list. I, have it, I, I do would. have the 22B and that on my list. Amazing and I think yeah. better looking, but it's also how expensive? Sure, it's very, <laughs> so, super super expensive. Yeah, super duper expensive. Uh, the, every th uh, three of the five on my list are super duper expensive. These aren't cheap um, now because they only made uh, twenty five hundred of them, but they still made way more than they did twenty two. Yeah, twenty two B. I think they made four hundred. Uh, it might be three hundred. It's it's in the it's it's find. under five hundred cars. I think it was four hundred they made, and maybe plus one prototype. Um, the twenty two B is sort of the ultimate Impreza, most collectible. Uh, it's got the wide body from the WRC car. Obviously, right hand drive only. It's got a bunch of weight reduction. It has the strengthened engine, uh, the closed deck motor that everybody wants in a Subaru. Yep. Um, there was how many was it? Four, did you get the number? Uh, I'm pulling up it's, that article it's, right it's now. in the hundreds. I for, I didn't write down exactly how. I think it's 400. Um, it's the you know, the blue with the gold wheels, the the two-door body. Uh, 424 were built. There we go. 400 for Japan, 16 for the UK, and then a couple for Australia. Um, what a terrible fucking photo gallery. Oh, there we go. 
I mean, that that is that car is everything that is great about Subaru. I agree. Yeah, and it, and in my opinion, it's kind of been downhill since then. Uh, I, well, I, I mean, I'm biased. I like the 06, 07 cars. I think the design language peaked around 06, 07. I think even the legacy was nice. Uh, I, I agree. Gotten, those those were nice. But it's not all gotten nice busier. This is this is gorgeous. Great. This yeah, is great. This I, is wanted, great. I, uh, I wanted, I uh, wanted, for my first car, I had a Subaru Legacy 2.5 GT. My, um, I wanted the 2.5 RS version of this. Yeah. But it was like a six-month wait to get one. Damn. And they had a Legacy GT in stock. And so the the dealer, you know, was like, oh, it's, you know, it's the same thing. This one's just four doors. And they were kind of right, but also kind of not. But your legacy um, GT, oh, yours wasn't turbo. That was no, it was the 2.5. Yeah, right. the Subarus were not turboed in this in this country until yeah, 2001 2002. or 2002. Um, but this is, I mean, you know, all of those RSTIs that people build, you know, they homebrew them with the powertrains, like Bucky's car and whatever. Mm -hmm. This is what they're all emulating. Yeah. And this is this is the real deal. They're, you mean, a shitty one is two hundred and fifty grand. One with a hundred thousand miles on it. A great one is half a million bucks. You're probably never going to see one in your life. Um, they're very rare. They're tucked away into collections. People don't really drive them anymore. How much are the Pro Drive one? They think they're they also made? like half a million bucks. Because that's an interesting comparison. Do sure. You want the real, the quote, real thing, or do you want the best version, which is made by Pro Drive? I mean, carbon right. body and stuff, and kind of built more motors for more motorsport. Yeah. Well, we saw the guys who were in uh, in Goodwood for the launch of the Pro Drive thing. Remember, we saw them at yeah. the car museum. Yeah. They all said the Pro Drive thing was completely batshit, and yeah. I think if you were to drive a 22B today, it wouldn't be completely batshit. It would probably be great, but it wouldn't be like insane. It's like it's it's like 300 horsepower, yeah. and you know it's probably fun and lively, but you know it's it's probably not crazy. But it's uh, there are a lot of diehard Subaru people out there, and. I mean, this is undeniably a great-looking car that's rooted in rally. There's a lot of motorsport good shit in there. And it's 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 one, if I was building a proper collection, it's one I'd want in my collection. I completely agree yeah. with Unlimited Money. The Pro Drive one, just for comparison, starts at six hundred grand and it's a six-speed sequential. Yeah. So, yeah, it's more motorsport, definitely a different kind of operating procedure. Yeah. Uh, all right, let me pull up. So my second one. Is Nissan Pulsar GTI? Oh, they're funky. This yeah, they're weird, they're neat. Uh, I realized for, after making my list, I had too many hot hatchy things. But this is a tiny car that has the Nissan Atessa all-wheel drive system and the SR20 Turbo that you get in like an S13 or mm -hmm. S14 from a different country. I just think it was a homologation car, so kind of a theme for me. But they were meant to compete in rally. They're tiny. They look fairly unassuming but you have this turbocharged engine that should be in a much larger car um they weigh 2700 pounds which is the same as an s13 but this has a fucking all-wheel drive system in it and they made it from 1990 to 1994 0 to 60 in 5.4 seconds uh 144 mile per hour top speed that's in probably tiny shady little car. in that yeah and um and they sold a couple of cool versions they sold one called the rb which was a stripped out version meant to be built into a race car. Mm -hmm. And then you could also get uh, the Nismo one, which came with a cage, diffs, footrests, welded structure plates. Um, oh, so that's a rally car. That one's a rally car. So the normal one is the GTI RA, which is similar to the one they sent to Europe where it was called the Sunny. But in Europe, the engine was choked a little bit because of emissions. Mm -hmm. So you want the Japanese one. I've never driven one of these. Neither have I. Yeah. I just think they're awesome. I've never I've only ever seen one at Top Rank. Uh I don't know if they have one in inventory now, they but don't. I've, I've I've only ever seen one. And it and the one they had at Top Rank was expensive. It was like a low mile really? one. Yeah, it was like in the forties. Whoa. Um but it was a really nice one. He said you can get kind of a beater one for cheap, but this one happened to be very nice. There was a beater one for sale in New Zealand when we were there, which yeah. was for 12 years ago and yeah it was like eight grand us yeah but that's because they got them there as cars it was and probably it was probably a bit haggard shitter. yeah, yeah it probably yeah. floated there yeah. on its own yeah <laughs> these yeah. are very cool um I'll, I'll 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 walk away from my very expensive uh taste uh i think the nissan s15 sylvia s15 i think it's i like it because it is uh it is cheaper uh than the gtr's 
Uh, I think it's the best looking Definitely. of the S chassis cars. Um, there's oh, here we people go. that yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, I just I think it's a I think it's a it's got great proportions. Yes. Um, I drove one once. I thought it drove really nice. Um, it uh, it was oh. it had good balance. It had uh, nice power. It was uh, relatively lightweight. Um, I feel like reasonably these practical. Look- they look so much more expensive than the 14 or 13 before mm-hmm. it. Like, and maybe it's just, you know, we see so many of those or maybe we see beat ones. But, like, the lines of this, I think, are phenomenal. It reminds me of, like, a Holden or something. Yeah. Whereas the S13, S14 just look like they're from a different era completely. Yeah. It looks, it looks 10 years newer. Yes. For sure. Yes. Um, they can they can be had for, I think, go go back to, does Tom Prank have any in inventory? Uh in, Turns five and twenty. It's this year did. also. Uh, I don't. Do we have any S fifteens here? He's on Figaro. Um, I don't see any S fifteens. It may. They may all. They all may be pre sold as well. Just like the. Uh, just like the Skyline. It would not you know? surprise me with the popularity um, of. Yeah, they're. You can. They don't you can one. definitely get them in Japan, and they'll bring them over. You know when they're legal. January. It's the beginning of them being legal, so there may be. Uh, uh, not a bunch of inventory of them, but uh, but I think they're really cool, and I think they drive really nice, and I think they're they're a very if you know you know car because most people are going to just look at that and just see a you know a two door whatever car, but yeah. if you know you oh you really know what that is yeah they're and they, super and cool. they have the great S chassis which just feels so natural doing anything yeah um, all right so my third one is. Uh, R34 GTXT. This is a tuning shop I have up, but that's because I think with the right body kit, they look awesome. You know, it's basically a sedan. So it's, it's an R34. R34 sedan, but it's only rear wheel drive. If you wanted an all wheel drive with these, with the turbo engine, it only came with an, in an automatic. Yeah. So you have to get rear wheel drive only, but it's got an RB25. It's got a good engine. Um, the the X is a slightly nicer one than the GTT. The X came with like xenons and some fancier mm-hmm. shit. And this has the Neo engine, which has variable intake cams, solid lifters, same rods and pistons as the RB26. So it's just a little bit beefed up. And of course, they quote made 276 horsepower. Um, I just think they look awesome, and I think. Like here, the from the rear three quarter. The rear three quarter is very good. Just the angle of yeah. this line, it's it's a little bit. Uh, I like these a little bit more than the chaser. You know, when the chaser is yeah. modified, like the one you drove, yeah, that looked great. Chasers are good sleepers. Yep. This is not a sleeper. No, you see those head those taillights. Yeah, you, know you know what this? Yeah, a chaser is great because it looks just like a late '90s Camry. In, if you look at it quickly, mm-hmm. but it's underneath, it's Supra, right? which is cool. And then inside, it's Lexus GS. It's actually a very funky thing. It's a Lexus GS interior, mostly, with this body that looks just like a little bit like a stretched Camry, mm-hmm. and then it has a 2JZ in it, which is really, really neat, and they're like super sleepery. They're starting to get pretty popular yep. in Orange County around here. Oh, really? Yeah, they fly under the radar. Most people look at that. If you don't know cars, you look at that and you go, that's a 90s Camry. Mm-hmm. And you have to actually really know cars to be able to tell the difference. I um, be able to find it. The one you drove, was it 700 horsepower? No, uh, yeah. Five. five. I mean, whatever the but fuck it, looked, it was. It was fast ooh, as shit. And by the way, shout out to Brad Brownell, who wrote an article for Jalopnik this past week that was like, the five greatest YouTube car reviews ever, and three of them were mine, which uh, it was the Zero Fucks really? Given oh, RX-7. Shit. All were from Tuned. Oh, nice. It was the, the BBI Autosport Project Nasty, oh. the Zero Fucks Given RX-7, and the um, that asshole's fucking twin charge Lotus. <laughs> Frank. Yeah. Um, uh, and, uh, shout out. And then, and, you know, Harris's F40 and F50 film was on there. Oh, and there yeah. was a, there were a couple other ones too. I, it might've been the top 10, three of the top 10, but, uh, yeah, Damn, all, all from tuned, which turns out, give us just a little bit of goddamn money, a little bit of goddamn money. We did a lot with pretty little money then. Yeah. yeah. But that's even so it, a little money then is more than you could earn on fucking YouTube. That's true. <laughs> um, point being, uh, in R34 Skyline, I would, I would say the wagon. 
I, the stagia, stagia, stagia I just don't wagon. like the way it, I like some of them from some angles and I went yeah. and looked at it and I saw one at Doug's place when I was down there and I think they're rad but uh if I had to choose I would go sit down. I like when they put the uh, the skyline nose on the that. stagia. The stagia if you put the sky, stock nose. Yeah, this, it's not good. It's but if you good. put a skyline nose on a stagia then it looks proper. That's that's my move. I, it's not on my list but I feel you on the sedan. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Uh, next on my list, Acura NSX R, which is uh, very, very rare. Only sold in Japan. Uh, obviously, right hand drive. It's like airbag uh, delete. Um, they uh, they did make them for both generations. There's a there's the early car, which is what we've got up on the screen here, and then there's the the later one with the fixed headlights. Um, Which one do you like? Did I find the wrong one? No, no, that's fine. Either, either, either is fine. Um, just it's it's you know it's just like the Integra Type R. It's got the solid mounts and all of the the weight reduction and all of that stuff that really makes things uh, very tight and very raw. We actually have one here at West Side Collector Car Storage, um, and it's amazing to look at. I've I've never driven it. I'm not going to ask the owner to drive his car, but. Um, you know, this is these are sort of the unobtainium, and and even though uh, I probably wouldn't want one because I have an NSX and it's left hand drive, and that just makes things easier. Given mm -hmm. that you know, I would I happily will go right hand drive in a car where that's your only option. But given the fact that that you can get all the NSX you want pretty much in a left hand drive, I I wouldn't do it. And these are huge money. Really? Yeah. These are huge money. I mean, What's the, what engine does it have? Is it, they, it's is the it same, jacked up at all? It's or? the same, but it's got it's got some beefy motorsport goodies. It doesn't make a ton more horsepower, but it's more fucking aggro. Shorter and gearing at all? I don't know. Okay. But there are enough changes where it does feel like a pretty um, see. pretty different car. Um, it's, it's really, everything is just tight. And uh, let's see, lightweight forged wheels. Um, it's, uh, 20 extra horsepower. Uh, it came with blah, 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 all the same. Higher final drive radiate ratio. So it's a 4.2 instead of a 4.06. That's for the five speed. Oh, nice. Okay. Uh, That'll help a little bit. A, bit, a different, a higher locking limited slip differential. <coughs> uh, it was 140 kilograms lighter than the standard variant, which is much, much lighter. That's pretty significant. Yeah. So well, it doesn't have, they take out the power seats. And that, that they take out the airbag steering wheel. Um, so down 300 pounds and with a shorter final yeah, drive. Yeah, it rips. Remember, didn't we do an episode of Tune where we drove a supercharged NSX and yeah. one had shorter gearing? The, that was an O2 with a six speed and it had a shorter final drive and it was lively. It was great. Yeah, I wouldn't necessarily want to do that in my own car because I do a lot of highway driving in that car. Um, and it wouldn't make a huge difference, but we drove that car on track yeah. and in the canyons and you could notice the difference. It was very cool. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's, it's, it's an incremental difference, but it's enough that, uh, you know, there's a radio delete, um, and you could get radio and, uh, stereo put back in and had some carbon stuff. It looks like Alcantara on the whole dash. No, I think it's just, I think it's just the texture of the leather. I don't think that it might be, a, okay. eh, it might be a flock dash. I'm not really sure. That also looks like an early press photo. So, Got it. um, but these are just immensely collectible. Let me go down. How many was the production? Production, uh, they did 483. 483. Wow. Yeah. Oh, this says discontinued in 1995. I saw photos. Maybe those were renderings. I saw photos of the, of on in the in the in the back page you had that had the fixed headlights. So maybe they never did that. Let's see. As early versions, I think they had straighter cut gears and then they changed it to reduce noise. Oh, maybe. Carbon options. Either way, if you've got cool. one, you're a boss, and they are three to six hundred thousand dollars. They're really, really expensive. Damn. So you got to be hardcore to get one of them. And wait, wait, you're, oh yeah, so those are legal. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. That's rad. So, it, they're super rad. Um, all right, my next one is gonna go something well, somewhat unique. Uh, in terms of size, Suzuki Cappuccino. You ever drive one of these? Nope. 
They're little. They are <laughs> they're, extremely little. They're really, really little. They are very small. Is this? That looks like Alana share. Uh, that does look like Alana. I think that is Alana. Is it? Who wrote this thing? I don't know, but I'm pretty sure that's Alana. Auto Express team. Okay. Well, shout pretty, out to Alana share. I'm pretty sure that's Alana. Driving Wonderful that. writer yeah. in person, short fit car and driver. Uh, so I, I think, well, from the profile. These have a magical proportions. They look like classic sports car, mm. but then when you park it next to anything normal, you go, "Oh, that's how small it is." Yeah, because if in, in a vacuum, it looks pretty good to me. And and Alana's a small person in this photo. She's driving it, but if you were if you're me and not her driving this car, you look very silly. Oh, totally. Uh, it's got a three cylinder turbocharged engine that makes what was the like eighty five horsepower. But yeah, maybe we could juice it a bit. Weighs sixteen hundred pounds. What's nuts is that, oh, I skipped the car by accident. Um, so my other car is a CXR, CRX SIR, which is only four inches longer than this thing. Uh -huh. So it's wild. Like, we got a CRX here, and it's four inches larger than a K car. Yeah. So that's how small that thing is. But the the top it comes with, it can be rocked as a coupe, Targa, or convertible. And yeah. the whole top fits in the trunk. Then you can't fit anything in the trunk. Japanese but roofs are really, how really cool. cool. How modular is that? Remember the Del Sol Trans top that I drove? No. The, tr the the trans top is real crazy. I wonder if you can find some a video of the trans top working. The, I have a, a one take from back in the day of the trans top. Basically, it's the whole it's the, it's a Del Sol where oh, the okay. entire trunk lid rises vertically and sucks the targa roof powered. Yeah, here we go. We get... So look at this. The whole trunk Look at this. It rises vertically, and it sucks the fucking targa roof into it, and then look, it, it's like a little oh arm God. comes and grabs it like a forklift. That's brilliant. Pops it off, and then and and like, whoop, like yeah, it's like a hermit crab. It reaches yeah. out from the shell. Yeah, it pulls this thing in, and then it goes back down <laughs> into the thing. Isn't that pretty cool? That's rad. <laughs> That's so that fun. very cool. Yeah, and then you've got that, and then you've got the Nissan. Uh, I guess it was a was it a was it the Pulsar, the one that had the th the the coupe, the pickup truck, and the had the three different roof configurations: coupe, Targa, and wagon. Is it a Pulsar? Uh, I think it was the U.S. spec Pulsar, which was different from the Japanese spec Pulsar. Oh, yep. Yeah, Nissan's right. Nissan's modular. Yeah, Pulsar mo Sportback. Yeah, yeah. That is an unattractive So that one vehicle. had three different roof configurations, too. That looks like that is weird looking. Um, the Cappuccino is probably the best driving of the K cars. Aluminum double wishbones, yeah. my friend. Like a GT3 RS has in the front. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it has some legit stuff, and I just think they look... Really cool. Uh, discs all around. It came with speed sensitive steering. I was wrong. It's 63 horsepower, not 83 mm. horsepower. But I just think it's very Japanese. Like we don't have yeah. K cars here. So I wanted something that's uniquely for Japan. This um, is the Japanese cool. version of like a bug eye sprite. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. They're cool. Yeah. I, I had to take my shoes off to drive it. I can't fit my feet in the pedal box. Um, it's a little small for me, yeah. but it's, it was cool. It, it, it had Miata vibes, mm -hmm. but even smaller. Even smaller. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> I've never been in a Miata and goes, you know what would make this better? <laughs> <laughs> uh, last one on my list, uh, Acura Integra Type R sedan. We never got Ooh. the sedan in America. And, uh, as cool as the, uh, as the coupe is, um, I actually think the proportions of the sedan are pretty rad. Uh, I think it's a I think it's a nice looking car. I think it's the rarest. Uh, I think it's rarer than the coupe. They made fewer them uh, than them. And I think what's great about it is if you were driving one in America, people would think it was fake. Oh yeah. And I love driving something that people think is fake, but that is real. Yeah, ninety five. That is a very good looking sedan. It is. It's got great proportions, yeah. right? Yeah. And, it, I mean, there's nothing about the Integra Type R that I could tell our audience they don't already know. It's one of the best handling front-wheel drive cars of all time. It's yep. got a rev-happy uh, engine. It's it's light. It's uh, it's every, every it's universally respected. I, yeah. There's nobody who likes cars that's like, you know, that Integra Type R is a real shitbox. Yeah. Nobody says that. The thing that basically set the bar for front-wheel yeah. drive engagement and fun. Yeah. yeah, but this one just uh, a little more usable back seat, mm -hmm. a little rarer, and a little more different. 
I think those are great criteria. Uh, all right, my last one is the CRX SIR. I was torn between this and the 1997 Civic Type R because um, I think I think in terms of front wheel drive hatch joy, like I just said, like Japan kind of did it better than anyone anyone else. I've never driven the Peugeot. What is it? Two hundred three. Two hundred six. Two hundred six. Yeah. Never driven one of those. So that might be um, amazing as well. But they, Japan just had so many great front wheel driving cars. And I chose the CRX instead of the Civic because I like the way it looks better than the Egg, the 1997 mm -hmm. Civic hatch. And, you know, this had like 160 horsepower. The weight was, oh yeah, it was barely larger than the K car. Oh, 19 inches longer, not four inches. I'm correcting myself left and right here. Uh, B16. 19 inches longer? 19 inches longer. That's a big difference. That's a lot. Yeah, I misspoke a earlier. A foot and a half longer than, than a cappuccino? A yeah. yeah. So that's, strike that, reverse it. Uh, 2,200 pounds. And yeah, I just think they look rad. I just really thought, I mean, I've always thought- It's very cool. rare to see a nice CR. That was great. It, it, yeah. Very rare to see a nice CRX um, on the road today. They yeah. a lot of them just rusted and fucking totally. fell apart. Yeah, um, but to see a really good one is is quite a thing. Yeah, you know, and these were you know fast, good for autocross stuff like that. Um, yeah, I'm just a fan. They're very fun to drive. They don't weigh shit. They're super cool. Yeah, you can strip some weight out of them for sure and be under under two thousand, no problem. So there you go. That's a main segment, and I'm going to conclude this main segment. Because we have a, a book to give away. Our friend Myron Vernis, who's a friend of the show and is a, a patron also, uh, would like us to give away a copy of his book, A Quiet Greatness, which is not just a book, but a series of books about Japanese cars. Um, you can find it at aquietgreatness.com. It's won uh, some awards. He sent us one. It's amazing. Oh, yeah. And so we will... If you, here's how we're going to do it. If you're a patron of the show, in the, the part of the, the, in the Patreon page where, you, where we write the comments uh, on the show, uh, I want to on see. On the future published show or this the show? The published one. Okay. The published one. You get, you'll get, your, you'll get the, the Patreon page. I want to know if you drive a JDM car, we're going to give a copy of the book to. He who has, or she, or they, who have a JDM car with the highest number of kilometers. I want to see a photo of the outside of the car. I want to see a photo of your odometer. Can people post photos in the comments? Mm, no, they'd have to link to them somehow. But So link okay. us your Instagram. Link us your Instagram. And we need you to prove that you own the car. Don't just grab something off of the internet. You know, like, Yeah. Like put a piece of paper with your piece of paper with your patreon handle like, yeah next to the odometer that'll do it yeah that. yeah and then tell us the kind of car and the highest kilometers on a jdm vehicle in america ideally that could be global whatever jdm vehicle uh will win a copy of the book it's that's how book. we're gonna it's do like that a multi-volume thing right yeah it's, it's, it's multiple like, books it's multiple yeah. books it all comes in a big it's like 50 pounds yeah yeah it's, it's serious a, it's a really well done Thing. Yeah, and it co it costs like several hundred dollars. Like it's not cheap. It's a, there's a there's a value to this particular price. It is a four hundred dollar <laughs> yeah. book set. Yeah, it's amazing. Very thorough. And shout out to our buddy Myron. Yeah, uh, book is called A Quiet Greatness, and uh, we're giving one away. So uh, link us your Instagram to show it's your car, and then post a photo of the odometer with your Patreon handle, and uh, we the the highest uh, kilometers wins. Okay, speaking of Patreon, there are a lot, a lot, a lot of questions, so we're not going to get to all of them. We're going to be a little more selective today. We'd be doing four hours of fucking radio if we were doing all of them. That's, that's not happening. Um, Patreon, by the way, thank you for supporting us. We sold 100 pens to our patrons only, uh, and so... Although I said they were limited to 100, they're not individually numbered, so... I didn't want to hose the public on, on the being able to buy the tactile turn smoking tire pen. So we made another hundred. So we did a second hundred for the public. So they don't get the discount. The patrons got the ten percent discount. But like um, Ferrari. 
It's just like <laughs> Ferrari. You just keep making them. So you're still probably not going to see one in the wild. There's 200 pens instead of 100 pens, but I didn't know how many we would sell. And it turns out the patrons really stepped up, bought all 100. So we wanted uh, the general public to be able to get some too. So uh, tactile turn pens are available. There's going to be a link in our Instagram uh, to buy them. Okay. Okay. Let's get to those questions. Okay, Gunner Ray, daily driver, sports car, and a classic 50 G's total. What are we going for? First off, if I had 50 G's to spend, I wouldn't buy three cars. That's, that to me, the, I mean, granted, this is probably sort of a fantasy question. Yeah, it's, it, but I would I not advise it, but this. It's like this is inspired by Throttle House's video. So, three car garage for 50 grand. I just, uh, that to me is not enough money for three quality cars. Yeah, but you don't. What, what define quality? You know, I don't. I want a, the cars to fucking work. Mm. I don't want them to be sketchy. I want them to be nice. Well, you can get something that runs well but has shit paint, like my car. Even your car is twenty five grand. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> right. So that's twenty five. So if you so, like you get an E forty six for twenty five, and then you got twenty five left. All right. Get, I'm buying you know, my buddy's Prius that can't be registered in California for twelve hundred dollars. Okay. That's the daily. All right. Okay. So we're now at forty eight. We're now at forty eight thousand five hundred dollars. Okay. Uh, I am gonna buy a a a sixty five Mustang fastback with terrible paint and a good motor Oof. for. Twenty five twenty five thousand yeah, dollars. They're expensive now. Yeah. So that leaves me like twenty three grand for a sports car. I would do a modern I would do a a great either a great E forty six three thirty or maybe a uh, uh maybe like a, a a Miata or something like a like a new a new ish like an N D two Miata. Hmm. I'm pretty surprised you went with an old car. Like this is classic. Not. A classic oh, car. Okay. It's three cores. Okay. I'd go daily, I'm gonna go Lexus E S hybrid. That will run forever. Uh sports car. I think I'd get a beat uh B R Z or F R S first gen mm -hmm. torque hole and all. And that would probably be like 15, 18. Uh, and then a classic, I would get a, like any, whatever, 60, like a Nova with shitty paint, but a good engine that I just do burnouts in. Actually, I'm changing mine. Classic car, my 91 Bentley. Is that classic? Oh, yeah. 20,000 bucks. Uh, sure. That's classic. Yeah. 1,500 for my buddy's Prius that can't be registered in fucking California. Shady. So that's 21,500 that leaves me about fucking 29 28 grand for uh for a sports car. Mm -hmm. I'm getting myself probably uh probably like 28 grand. Oof. I could probably get some Cayman for that. Probably get a I could probably get an a, an earlier early-ish decent shape Cayman probably. S right now. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. Market soft, I might be able to get a 996 convertible for that. Good 996 convertible, six oh, speed. Yeah. I also think an ES hybrid would be too expensive, so I'd switch that to a Volt, and then I think the math would work out. Yep. Uh, Sean Finney says BMW announced the Z4 will have a manual transmission for the next model year. I have star, uh, asterisk, I've already requested one. It's coming to the fleets in March or April. Uh, does it have the makings of a future classic? Um, so. Possibly. I can say that it will depreciate slower than the regular one, mm -hmm. if the F-Type manual is any indicator of that. Um, it will have a small but dedicated fan base, for sure. Because I think those have a small but dedicated market in general. Yeah. So I think the question is, will it attract a larger audience as it ages? You know, genu general car enthusiasts, will they go, actually, the Z4 manual was pretty good? Because that's always the question for the future classic. Yeah. Does everyone start to pay attention to it like we did with the Z8 or something else? I mean, the manual really made the Supra a lot better to drive. Mm -hmm. And this is going to be the same manual, and it's the same powertrain, and it's the same chassis. It's tuned a little differently, but, like, that's what it's going to be. So 
having not driven an automatic Z4, I can tell you that it becomes more desirable with a manual to mm-hmm. me for sure. Um, hopefully, it hopefully the manual feels like the Super One. You know, in terms of that, the shifting action on that was better than the last, uh, the M4 manual we yeah. drove. So whatever they did with the bushings and shit, it felt yeah. really good. So hopefully that. Yeah. I don't I, future classic t- talking about future classic of a car that's not even out yet is a that is I don't want to speculate on that. I Someone, I mean sometimes we can have a gut reaction where the car is so popular before it's out everyone goes yes mm-hmm. and you you know I think like I think the C- CTRs are like that uh, anything that comes out in small volume but this I don't know if this car is attractive enough both literally and like to our generation of car folks, do, are we interested that much in convertible cruisers? Yeah, where it's going to get that wide appeal. Yeah, I don't know. And future classic is typically defined by people in high school want it now, have posters on their wall, can't afford it, and then in twenty five years when they can afford it, they realize that that they're out there and they want one. Mm-hmm. I see that uh, the Z4 or the, the the Supra has a higher chance of that than the Z4. Yep, for sure. Agree. Yeah, Z4s have always been kind of soft, except for the M's. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, Joe, a, it's a golf uh, car. Yeah. Sorry. Joe says best exhaust note and driving experience balance for thirty thousand dollars, and then suggests Maserati Gran Turismo S, the V10 M cars, the Mercedes C63. Of those, the C63, Ooh, yeah. for sure. I would say the E92 M3 is going to be a lot better than the V10 M cars. The yeah. V10 M cars are only okay. They just feel heavy, right? They're heavy. That, the SMG gearbox sucks yeah. Sucks horribly, and you can't get a good manual one for 30 k Yeah, and the C63 at that price, the, the auto was fine. The 8-speed, it was okay. Yeah. It was definitely better than the SMG. I mean, thirty grand gets you a great Corvette. <laughs> Uh, true. And now you've got exhaust note driving experience. About thirty grand gets you a Mustang Boss three hundred two, which will sound really nice. And that's the best driving experience of the four. Yeah, thirty grand will get you an Audi RS four, which will sound excellent and uh, and drive pretty well. I think, but that one might be a little have high mileage because we looked those up recently, yeah. and a good one was like forty five. Okay. Yeah. Uh, huh. I mean, the Maserati does sound good, but I don't want you don't want a thirty thousand dollar Maserati. I feel like that's all it does well. Yeah. Uh, Miguel says, "Have we ever thought about doing some sort of award show at the end of the year?" Uh, I think we tried it once, didn't we? Do that once? We did it on the podcast once. Yeah, yeah. But we, did it but work? we didn't do it on the main channel. Yeah. I don't. I don't know how it did. Yeah. Uh, downloads wise. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't know how it works. Uh, how the how the, I have to go. We'll have to go back and see if the numbers worked. If that's something that enough people uh, want to see that it is worthwhile. Um, Christian says you mentioned the EV Macan will sell alongside the gas Macan. Will they sell a gas Boxster alongside the EV Boxster? Yes, for a little while. The seven one eight gas Boxster and Cayman will continue for a few years alongside the EV Boxster. John says, uh, did I consider buying an R34 GTR Skyline? Per- did I consider buying one instead of the NSX? Um, I, I don't buy cars like that, um, typically. Cars, it's not like, well, I could get this or I could get this or I could get this. I don't sit there and go, I have this money. What should I spend it on? And then weigh pros and cons of each car. I cars typically find their way to me and if they're amazing and I don't want to let them go then I buy them that's the case with the uh with the the Bentley it's the case with the Countach it's the case with the NSX it's the case uh I mean my Porsche uh I ordered but it was only after driving the the demand one and going oh well this is the fucking shit uh same thing with the safari car before that um The Ferrari 328 was the only car that I own right now that I didn't, that I wanted one generally and then looked around at a few different options. Um, So I owned an R32 for a while. It was great. Um, But I uh, didn't want to spend 
the kind of money it would take to get a mint condition R34. I like to buy really mint cars, and I didn't want to spend the kind of money it would take to get a mint one, which would be double or triple what I paid for the NSX. And the NSX is absolutely mint. Um, it's uh, the being an 05. It's very rare, and the odds of seeing another 05 that was already literally in my fucking possession because it was stored here and I knew the car. Um, that one just came to me. And so I wasn't seeking an NSX or shopping around or going, should I buy this or that? It was, this one is here. It's for sale. I can get it for what turns out was an excellent price and I'm not letting it go. And so, so it wasn't an either or. I'd love an R34, but they're so expensive. Um, uh, the one I, I I can't afford them, but like maybe one day. But they're they're so so expensive. Um, Ivan says, "What recent non U uh, what recent uh, non JDM cars do you expect to be highly desirable in the future for import? Uh, e sixty one M five Touring Alpine one ten cars from Europe. I think we should just do this as its own segment. That uh, that is going to be its own segment." I think we wrote it down, actually. Oh, okay. Non, I think it's in the list. Uh, sh Tim says, should I sell my beloved Daily Driver 997 Carrera S manual? It has 80,000 miles, and I'm trying to decide whether or not to keep it long-term and add a beater to keep the miles down or sell it for something different. Um, oh, and then he has a whole huge list of cars. I mean... Here's the thing. You say you refer to this car as beloved. And why are you keeping the miles down? The mi it's already got so many miles that it's not a collector car. Mm -hmm. It would cost you more to sell it, buy a different car, and then put a whole bunch of miles on that or also have a daily driver than it would cost you to just keep driving this car. This car at 80,000 miles is already close to the floor of what these cars would, are going to cost. Putting more miles on it from here will be very, very cheap. Mm -hmm. it might, you, might, you might get to the point where you need some maintenance. Oh, yeah, sure. But it, it's not like you've got a super low mile car that you're afraid of putting miles on. It's already got a ton of miles. And, and so if you want to add a beater so that you don't have to drive it in shitty weather or something, that's one thing. But, but like, I, you know, to you've got a whole list of other cars here. If you were to sell the 997, get an E39 M5, an E92 M3, a Cayman, or a V8 Vantage, like, I wouldn't sell a 911 that I already liked to buy one of those cars. Yeah, you know, unless you really wanted a different experience. Yeah. But if you don't and you love this car, and he says uh, he has a winter beater already. Yeah. So So if you buy an E39 M5, a 92 M3, a Cayman, a Vantage, or an Alpha, Alpha Julia, buy any of those cars, every one of those cars needs five grand of something, right? Whereas your car is a known quantity. So if you like it, continuing to drive it, particularly if you already own a winter beater, then driving it more from there will be cheap. Yeah, and then he has a mods plan, BBS's intake suspension. So that will transform how the car you own feels. And mm -hmm. if you really like the engine and you like the rear engine and all, you like all that stuff, because some of these other ones are different platforms, so I understand the like, ooh, maybe I'll try something totally different. But if you can just drive a friend's front engine V8 car and you might go, oh, that's actually not special, just keep your 997. Yeah. I'd rather own a good 997 than pretty much everything you listed there. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's see. <clears throat> uh, George Sherman said, on other shows you've mentioned clear money minting opportunities for brands. Example being limited edition manual Ferraris. How are examples like this not easy sells for publicly traded companies focused on shareholder value? I don't know. I don't know how they're not easy sales. I mean, it could be a cafe thing with them. Like they, they need to balance out their emissions. Yeah. So they might be in that situation. They don't have any pure EVs to balance out. You know, Porsche, all the companies that are still selling manuals 
have a pure EV portfolio. True. Ferrari right. doesn't, right? Lamborghini doesn't. Yeah. So a manual might be substantially worse fuel economy than what they're doing, and so they may not have an ability to balance it out. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I think Ferrari is also such a proud company in terms of the next generation tech and the Formula One tech and all that. They, which it's weird because they do look backwards also. The Daytona SP3 and the, the Monza, like those are clearly retro inspired designs. Mm -hmm. But the technology is always forward thinking. Yeah. And I think, I don't think they'd have to worry about manual sales cannibalizing or being too attractive because the, the paddle shifts of cars are so good now. Mm -hmm. I think anyone would go, there's room for both. Yeah. I love both of them. But uh, it's also, as he said, it's publicly traded. So now you have a board that's helping oversee these things. So maybe it could be that the cost of building, let's say, 100 manual transmission cars is so great that the board could vote, well, we're, we don't think it's worth allocating this money for this. Maybe the profit is zero. Yeah. Or we, you know, we don't know what it would cost for them to tool up to do that. Yeah. It might not be worth it. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, I mean, just that my... With having no insider knowledge, I go, how could they not sell a manual transmission, you know, version of the fucking Daytona SP3 for double the money? They'd still find someone to buy that. They would. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. To me, it seems like a gimme, but there's probably a whole bunch of factors that I don't understand. Yeah. Because there almost always are. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. Don't Sink says... We'll skip that one. Okay. Don't Sink says, I've recently become enamored with Porsche 930s, never had the chance to drive one. Do you think the driving experience is worth their roughly $130,000 price point, or are buyers mostly paying for the car's history and looks or somewhere in between? I don't love most 930s. Uh, I The only ones I really like are the very end-run cars, the 89s with the five-speed G50. Mm -hmm. I don't like the four-speed cars. Um, there are people that do. Um, you know who likes four-speed cars? The people who also like four-speed muscle cars that are used to like shit down shifting into first all the time. <laughs> you got to you, you got to be comfortable putting the car in first rather than second. But with a muscle car, you don't need first. You just True. keep it in second. Yeah. Um, the five-speed cars, the eighty-nine cars, which are much more expensive than the four-speed cars because they're so much better to drive, are definitely worth the money. They're awesome. The four-speed cars, for me, nah. Um, I'm going to pass. I'd rather spend half or two-thirds as much on a great Carrera, uh, maybe one with a whale tail if I wanted that. You could even get a turbo look car, which has basically all turbo body work on it. Um, um, I think there there is a value to them for a collector. And I think if you've got a collection of Porsches, then it's an experience you can add to your quiver, as it was. But if I was going to just buy one um, air-cooled car, it would not be a four-speed 930. I, I like the NA, the feeling of the NA engines much more than yeah. the peaky turbo thing. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah. Let's see. Okay. Uh, well, that's a lot of words. I can't. Um, <laughs> Trey in Houston. Up, oh, Trey? loves his notice watch. Thank you. I'm so glad you bought it and came to collect it in person. Mm -hmm. Wants to replace the wife's 2018 Panamera 4S. She wants a Tycon. Any specific warnings, recommendations regarding a 2020 or 2021 model? Pass. They had some issues. Well, so and Chris Nolke replied and said, make sure if you get one, it has this PCM upgrade because mm. he loves his 2022. So, I mean, PCM, like it's a main computer. Yeah. You definitely want that because that yeah. might help some of the issues they've had. Possibly. But there were a lot of battery failures in 2020 cars. There was a lot of... May, I mean, at main the battery very, or the little battery? No, big battery. Ooh. High voltage battery. Ooh. At the very least, you want that extended warranty. The big extended, the biggest extended warranty. They drive great. They're lovely to look at. Like, I get why people want them, but man, I would be very nervous about purchasing um, an early Tycon. Um, I haven't heard any horror stories about the recent cars, the 23s, 22s, but the 20s and 21s, there were definitely some teething issues. Let's see, they had a recall over high voltage battery yeah. fire concerns, yeah. faulty charging cables. Um, 
Yeah, there only one percent of the cars. Uh, only one percent of the cars had the fire hazard, but there may have been other problems. All right. Uh, Bad Gardener says, "I'm confused on what you say about Cybertruck not needing to pass tests in order to be sold to the public. I feel like I've heard companies not selling cars in the U.S. because it's expensive to get cars road legal selling in the U.S. But if there's no test, why would that be the case? Uh, well." So we're talking about different types of tests. There's emissions testing. A lot of those cars that uh, that are not sold in the U.S., their engines would not pass U.S. emission standards, mm -hmm. California emission standards. There could be diesel engines that can't be sold here. Um, there's cars that are designed for certain markets where they're right-hand drive only. Can't sell those here. There's also crash standards where you're crashing into another vehicle. But yeah. the test we've been speaking about with the Cybertruck is crashing into humans. Pedestrian standards. Yeah. So Europe has pedestrian crash test standards, which the U.S. doesn't have at all. Most passenger cars are built to the pedestrian standards in Europe. Um, cars that are designed to be sold globally. So that's one hurdle if it's, it, that, that it doesn't have to pass in the U.S. Mm -hmm. That's the test we were talking about with Cybertruck. Um, but there's other, there's other reasons like engines do need to pass emission standards and stuff like that, um, in order to be sold in, in America. There's also other cars that are not sold in America because they don't see there's a market here, like tiny little hatchbacks, um, at, you know, weird stuff like that. Subcompact cars, um, K cars. Yeah. yeah. Things yeah. like there's, there's, there's cars that could be sold in America, like the Volkswagen Amarok pickup truck, which is basically a Touareg with a bed that they could sell in America if they wanted to, but they didn't see a market for it and they didn't go through the certification process. They're not saying that they couldn't go through the certification process if they want, right? Yep. Um, uh, Okay. Uh, and I'm not sure about Andrew's question. I don't know if I have a good answer for that. Justin Gerard says, uh, wondering if either of you can share a story of a car you owned that you gave up on, mechanically awful, lost interest, etc. cetera. I mean, I've said a couple times, but I couldn't get rid of that Hummer H1 fast enough. <laughs> that thing was heinous. Yeah, dude, that, that so thing, loud on was, the road. Yeah, and was, I was only going 40 when yeah, I was Yeah, it was one. garbage. Yeah. yeah. I, did you ever g I give up on a car? I don't know about. It. I don't. No, I mean I get lost interest. Sure, that's why I moved on from. I, mean, I don't know Miata, Jetta. Sure, but I've never like given up. I've never had something that broke so often that I went, I can't fix this. Yeah. Get rid of it because I never bought something or had a project to that degree. I lost interest in my C5 Corvette, but I had it for 16 years, and I just reached the end of the, the end of the, you know. A dude in my improv class, his dad was on the design team of that car. A C5? Yeah. Oh, nice. Super cool. Extra nice. design team. I said it was good. he did good work. Uh, let's see. Features that aren't. Tim A., what are car features that seem obvious but aren't common, like air-conditioned cloth seats or adaptive cruise control with a manual transmission? That one actually is a good one, adaptive cruise on a manual transmission. Only probably, I don't know. Half of the cars yeah. that we drive with manuals have adaptive think, crews available. I think Toyota the Mustang has it now. had it. The Dark Mustang Horse had, had it. it. And WRX? Uh, yeah, had it. WRX had it. But it was I, definitely more rare two years ago. We drove a couple of things that didn't. I think the CTR didn't have it. Uh, my Porsche doesn't have it. My seven, my Spider doesn't have it, oh, wow. even as an option. Wow. Yeah. And it's a great feature. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, cloth, yeah, cloth seats with. Air conditioning, I think, are very rare yeah. because the air conditioning is usually attached to the luxury package, and then you're going to get leather or something like that. Cloth seats in luxury cars in general. I, God, I love a good cloth seat in a luxury car, and they just nobody's doing that, I which wonder, is so weird because there's just like, you know, that no one wants to use leather anymore, right? They they're all using synthetics, but, right? But it's just plastic. Yeah, but but like I can't, I I don't know why they can't make luxury cloths a thing that works like the fucking volvo I, i'll say it again the fucking wool the wool the best keep everyone should be doing that i think it's just i think it's a market reaction situation yeah. like the porsche the 50th anniversary one yeah the targa had yeah. the um the corduroy, corduroy which we loved that was but fantastic. if you ask a lot of people what do they think of corduroy they think of pants in the 70s yeah not and i also 
I think it might be hard to make an air conditioned seat cloth because the leather always has the little holes mm -hmm. and those won't tear open because of the material. Yeah. But if you need the air to pass through the cloth, that might be hard. Yeah. But it'd be, it'd be sweet. Um, let's see. Uh, Flannel Bob, are third gen Ford probes actually good looking and cool from an American yes. domestic market viewpoint? Yes. Uh, it, it, I I think they're cool. Other people uh, don't. It's Fair. the same. It's platform shared with the Mazda MX-6, um, which I think most people would say is objectively cooler. I actually remember that photo from the from the 1993 car and driver. Is, so. Yeah, um, and they use the KLZ uh, V6, which is the little the little small displacement V6 that uh, the MX-6 V6 used, which is actually pretty neat. Um, I think this was a great looking car. I think it caught a bad rap. My friend's uh, sister had one in high school. I drove it a couple of times. I thought it was nice. The, uh, a guy who lived around the corner worked, he was, on a, he was a crew on, for an IndyCar team, mm -hmm. and he drove one. And I think it's a better looking car than the MX-6 personally. Mm -hmm. um, I think it looks better than the like, MX-6 as well. I think the MX-6 is a little frumpy. Yeah, this looks a little Solara. Yeah, a little round in the front. And yeah, the probe is really good looking. I like the probe. That's not it's not its best angle. No, but I'm trying to get the. Here, there you go. There's the, the gallery. gallery. Yeah, the probe looks nice. Looks like an S chassis. It does. But it's front wheel it's drive. Bigger rear window. Yeah, that's not its finger angle. I I thought and still think there that go. this was a underappreciated and nice car. Yeah. Yeah. But pro uh, pro probe, pro uh, yeah. Uh, Toblerone Malone, do you have right a now. preference on floor versus top mounted gas pedal or are you indifferent? Uh, I'm kind of indifferent. indifferent. Kind of indifferent. I, m I much more consider the, uh, the, the, um, the spacing between the pedals for heel toe, yeah. I think is definitely. And the, and the, the throw of each pedal and mm -hmm. the accuracy with which it talks to the system it's activating. So yeah. I think with floor mounted pedals, mostly that's like a motorsport product. And so they've also paid a lot of attention to the springs of yeah, the brakes and stuff. That's so it probably true. feels good. Yeah. But uh, you can do that with top mount too. Yeah. Yeah. Chris Nolke, what vehicle that you drove recently, other than the Bentley, uh, has the most incredible or surprisingly good ride? I thought the Gunther had a great ride, actually, which, it, which considering how it looks, is pretty shocking. Um, I feel like we drove something cheap. Well, I mean, the Lucid, but that's not cheap. No. Something cheap that had a very nice ride. Uh, type S had a better ride than the CTR, but I would. Oh, the, yeah, the Integra curious. Type S is nice. Oh, Lotus Amira. Oh, yeah. <coughs> Amira has a fantastic ride. Yeah. Um, that was good. Both the four cylinder and the six cylinder had a, had a very nice ride. Yeah. Okay. Um, this. Well, you may be in trouble, Finn. <laughs> Lease is up on my Tacoma. My priorities are a manual transmission, good miles per gallon, quick enough, decent amount of suspension travel for shitty roads, $25,000 budget. Uh, get a Crosstrek. Oh, yeah. That's... Can you get it with a manual? Crosstrek set manuals? Ooh, I don't know. I don't... I, don't I think you can. Seven, maybe, see. I think you can. I think you could probably get a cross trek with a manual, right? Yeah. Yeah, you, you can. can. That's what you want. Cross trek manual. It's a little slow, but that will do everything you're saying. Yeah. And it will be. It'll be fun on shit roads. Uh, it won't be fast, but it'll be fun. Uh, but he suggests also a Mark Seven of Volkswagen GTI, which I think would be an all right option too. Yeah, but it might be. Too, I mean, depends on what this shit road is, but yeah, it says yeah. decent suspension travel, and the GTI yeah. is pretty low. That is pretty low. Is adaptive suspensions optional in the GTI? Uh, I think I it's know. an option. I think, so. I think you have to get, like, the Autobahn package or something. Yeah, you did in the I eight. think I would want to I'd make sure you get the adaptive suspension in the GTI. Uh, Brian Gallagher says... <laughs> I recently achieved a life goal of mine of owning a fire truck. I bought a 1989 Pierce Arrow and have an annoying case of buyer's remorse ever since. I love owning it and being able to call it mine. Do you have any tips for getting over buyer's remorse? Sell the fucking thing. Yeah. I mean... Just get out of it. I love owning it and being able to call it mine. Uh, I, can you go on an adventure with it? Drive it somewhere. You know, like do some do something with it other than like 
having it just sit there. The question is, what is the what is the remorse part? Right, I don't get it. But if he loves it, then why do you have buyer's remorse? Yeah, I mean, it's probably huge and stupid. Yeah, that's true. Like, what what do you do with a fire yeah, truck? I mean, you have to take it to like parades and car shows and let yeah. kids cl- climb on it. Yeah, and maybe you could do a partnership with the fire department and bring it to things. That you, like, you, good point. As you said, do things with it. Yeah. Because right now, you just have a giant thing you stare at and it takes up lots of space. So if you don't use it, you'll go, what am I doing with this? Yeah, maybe you could put it in on a registry for film rentals, you know, for, for movies and TV shows, depending on where you live. Let's see what a 1989 Pierce Arrow fire truck looks like. Oh, it looks exactly <laughs> like you fucking think it does. <laughs> it looks- that is a stereotypical fire truck. Wait, go back. There was one. That one was for lit, was for sale. I wonder if this is the one he bought right, right. here. Used right this top one. Nineteen eighty nine Pierce Arrow fire truck. It's a pumper. I mean, that's enormous. Jeez, that is fire truck. Like that's twenty one thousand miles though. It's, it's funny. It's not classic looking in the sense of uh, you know kind of rocket. It's age. It's not Jay. Le- it's not Jay Leno fire no, truck. This just looks like a fire truck that would pull up and help you put uh, yeah. your house out. You could slam it on bags. <laughs> Huge I mean, bags. you you could turn you could turn it into like an RV if you wanted to fucking you wanted the double. Holy shit! Look at those levers. Those are fun. You could double and triple down by turning it into an RV. You know or. Or you could find some kind of Hollywood situation where you could earn some money off it. I would do that. Um, but, Man. yeah, what do you do with something this big? I mean, it's just huge. I, I think you <laughs> I think you go to schools and you do with fire department. But they'll just bring their fire truck. I don't know, man. Yeah. Because it's, yeah, it, it's a weird <laughs> period. It's not from the 60s. Yeah. It doesn't look, no offense, it doesn't look that cool. Yeah. This just looks like a fire truck yeah. that you'd get, you know, the airport would have. Yeah. And it's got storage for stuff, and it probably weighs 80,000 pounds. Yeah. Maybe you could turn it into an RV. Can you I look think, up look up a, uh, a fire truck, con, or RV converted fire truck? Let's see if someone's actually done that. Get a cutting wheel. Uh, so there's, a, there's someone who has done it. Just go to images. Let's see if. You could turn it into a Burning Man vehicle. Oh, dude, like lots of people have converted these things into RVs. Wow, look at that one. Which one? Oh, tribute to 9-11. That's, that might be something that's not an RV, but it looks like but they've look, built. Like these, to me, you know, you got to put a roof on it. Oh, this that one's pretty good, cool. No, the one to the left. That one's pretty cool. It is, but I think they had to build. Yeah, look, open I the picture. Think. Let's see. Oh, so these people took, like, yeah, they built it into an RV. Now, that's pretty cool actually Open this. oh shit you need to be a member of this forum rvlife.com yeah it uh they basically had to fill in the whole middle section yeah because this truck the pierce arrow it's yeah. huge open area for axes and people to stand and levers and things so all of this is now roof i think yeah depends on how much construction you want to do i yeah. think i would sell it i'd probably sell it too but but uh if you wanted to keep it and you wanted to make it useful you got a race car, you could probably tow something with it. You'd be the sickest tow vehicle of all time. But you're use, you're wasting so much energy moving a, and a water tank that you don't have to fill and all of this stuff. Right. You know, it's it's just cumbersome for the sake of driving a fire truck. And then if, God forbid, you're not a fireman, Mr. Uh, Gallagher, people are going to go, oh, are you a fireman? You go, no. Yeah. And they go, oh, okay. So now you just have a really ridiculous tow vehicle. Right. I would sell it. Uh, mas- mascalismo. Uh, in one of the last crew shows, you were talking about affordable rear drive engaging sedans. Haven't heard anything about the Cadillac CT4 V series. Is it a black wing light or is it a bit dull? I recommend you well, go watch my video in that car because I used some fairly colorful language in calling that car terrible. <laughs> oh, not the <laughs> not the black not wing. Not the black wing. Light. Yeah, that that is yeah. a there's a big discrepancy between black wing and the rest of those cars. Well, the Black Wing is an M3. Yeah. Like it's a awesome. legit good M3 from Cadillac. Yes. But this one you did not like. I, at all. You really didn't like I it. I yelled at the gearbox. It was it was bad. Was it all-wheel drive? Uh, no, the five the five was. The four was rear. Was, okay. And they were both bad. Yeah. yeah oh, right. They gave you the all-wheel drive, all-wheel drive one afterwards. And yeah. And said, maybe you like this. Yeah, and, and it was not good. Yeah. RS1 Daily says, with how good sim setups now, is it time to start saying the best driver's car for 5K is a new computer wheel and seat? No. 
No, I mean, if you want to, sim setups are are cool if that's what you want. It's not the same as driving. It's not. But 5K won't get you very much anymore, unfortunately. Yeah, it's like a beat Miata. I they won't. But the Sims he won't. Yeah, Sims have their place. They're great for so many things, but uh, it won't take you anywhere, and it won't take you to an experience. Uh. I don't know um, the answer to Paul's. I don't know the answer to Paul's question, and I did see the shout out, Aaron, to uh, us, our podcast on the Cybertruck video. I don't know if that's a troll or a, uh, a shout out, but it was funny. I don't know. Considering it's from Throttle House, I bet it's funny. It's probably they're fun. not really yeah. troll. People. No, no, they're not. They're not dicks. Yeah. It's, it's funny. Uh, Aiden Squires, curious on your opinions of the trend of registering expensive court sports cars in Montana. It is borderline tax fraud, right? If not, at least it's unethical. Um, but most public companies are based in Delaware, so is it really a big deal? You're talking first off two different things. A public company that is not that is. It's incorporated in Delaware. You still, like, for instance, the smoking tire was incorporated in Delaware, but we are still doing business in California and pay taxes here. Yeah. Like, uh, we're off. Companies incorporated in Delaware is tens of thousands, yeah, I yeah. believe. So but it, it's yeah. not like it's not like you don't you, you it's not like you incorporate in Delaware and then don't pay taxes in the state in which you do business. Right. Um, so the thing about Montana is it's. In California, if you live in California and you have your car in California, you, it is a law that you register your car in California. That's for two reasons. One is you have to pay taxes on the car. Two is there's emissions and stuff, carb, right? There are a bunch of cars that are sort of under the table, will not pass California emissions. And I'm talking about cars that are sort of resto mods, we could be talking about certain air-cooled resto mods. We could be talking about a variety of resto mod type cars. We could also be talking about certain multi-million dollar cars from Europe that will not pass a California smog test. Okay. Then there's the tax thing. It's, it, is, it is borderline f tax fraud to operate a car in Montana and, and, or operate a car in California and registered in Montana. There are there are ways, you know, that people get away with it because it is not legal for a CHP or sheriff or cop to pull you over specifically because you have an out of state plate. They can they can you can someone could file a report and narc you out and then you have to deal with the cops and explain where why this car is here. Um, there are services that help you, you know, do this and in a variety of different ways. Um, I am, you know, not really for it. Uh, and I talked about this with Doug when he came on our show. Um, in, but California also, there's also classic cars that fall between the year of 1976 and 2000, where those cars will not pass California emissions, even when they're stock. And California doesn't offer you a way to register those cars in California and give them their tax money, but without having to, you know, go through smog. Because they want them off the road? Uh, they, I don't, I don't really know. And, and we just talked about this on Spike's show. There was this study that people freaked out about for a minute where they were sending out surveys to people who owned old cars asking about how often they drove them and the type of fuel they used. And they were talking about vapors from sitting and whatnot. And fucking crazy ass right wing websites were like, carbs coming for your classic car. California's blah, 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 coming for your classic car. It turns out that was from the Daily Caller. Yeah, I remember that. It turns out that what that study was really trying to do was find out if there's a way to exempt those cars from fucking smog. That it was the, literally doing the opposite thing that people were freaking out that it, they were doing. Because if they found out that people drove them infrequently, yeah. they could go, oh, okay, we can give them a pass. Correct. Yeah. These cars, these, look, California has a lot of stupid shit they're doing. The fucking wiener guy we talked about in the last show. But this one actually is possibly good. So as I talked about with Doug, because we both have Countach's, which don't fucking pass California smog. My car, personally, has decades of records of 
previous owners of this car trying and failing to pass California smog over and over and over. The previous owner, who shall remain unnamed, found a shady way around it. And people do that, too. If you see a a Countach with California fucking tags on it, they know a guy. They know the guy. They fucking hooked a Ford Focus up to the machine and printed out a fucking sticker. The car will not pass smog. My car has cats. It's a U.S. spec car, full smog equipment, wouldn't pass. Over and over and over and over and over. California does not offer a path to pay the taxes to operate that car with a California tag, but but with being exempt from the smog equipment. So there are some people who go through Montana because they have one of these cars that falls into the gray area and they don't own a home or whatever in another state. But when you, what you see here is you also see new cars that have that. Totally. And they are just doing straight up tax evasion. Totally. And they, and they can say, you know, oh, I keep it there and I bring it here, but you see that year round. And totally. Like, yeah, you know, new Range Rovers and stuff like that. And they are just literally doing evasion. Yes. Taxes. Yes. Yeah. And. It's, you know, if you drive that car around and you're not going to get, you're not driving in a manner in which you're going to get pulled over, you're going to get away with it for a while. It's a, it's a hard thing to enforce because the cops are not, they can't pull you over simply because your license plate is not from California. It's like a violation mm-hmm. of the Fourth Amendment. But if you get pulled over, then they can ask. If you get pulled then, over, yeah. particularly if you have a California driver's license, because if you have a, a if you have, if you live in another state, for instance, my parents live in Connecticut. They have a house in South Carolina, and they drive a car back and f- it was it's easy it was easier for one reason or another billing or whatever to register their car in Connecticut that they keep in South Carolina. Nobody gives a shit. It's not it's and not only do they not give a shit, it's not even a law. They don't care. It's there are some states that have this law. Massachusetts is another one, which is funny because our friend Doug goes back and forth between California and Massachusetts. And he he talked about this on the show that it was funny because each if we when he drives back and forth, if he's literally the letter of the law. He has to register his car in Massachusetts every summer and then register it in California again when he comes back. Like, that's what the law says he's supposed to do. It's so dumb. He's breaking, whether, no matter which of his homes he registers the car at, he's breaking the law when he, his drives, own, over the when he drives over the other one, which is just a dumb system. So you can kind of understand why, in some cases, they don't offer a path to doing the right thing for certain types of cars. Yeah, it'd be nice if they figured it out a way for the classic car thing. Yeah, and you know, make track mileage or something yeah. like that. Yeah, I mean, if you've got if you've got a classic car that's not a primary car, you've got a collection. It's under co- classic car insurance. You know, there's other ways to verify that. If you instead of doing a smog check, they just looked at your odometer. Yeah, said you drive this car a thousand miles a year, you're exempt. That would be enough. They'd still make you go every year. The smog station just has to look at your odometer and, and make sure it wasn't unplugged. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, there's whatever whatever methodology you, f- you do, someone's going to find a way to cheat. Mm-hmm. But a lot of people would happily, you know, pay- especially with the insurance records, because the insurance usually tracks your odometer, right? Every, every, some some it. do. But yeah. They, there would be a way to make this system, I think. And it would be it'd be nice for that for the classic car owners. And it would be nice to not see. New Range Rovers driving yeah. around evading yeah. taxes. My classic car insurance for my collection does not track the odometer, but they have as a requirement to have the classic car insurance that you have a daily driver right. vehicle mm-hmm. registered on a standalone regular policy. Yeah. So for me, that's the Ford my and, and my Vespa, both of which are all actually all of my motorcycles are registered on a, the same policy as the Ford. They're not on the classic policy. Um, but yeah, it's also it's. I can understand why certain people do that. They don't necessarily have another path to owning that type of car. Um, but but yeah, when you see you see a fucking a, a Pagani or a Koenigsegg or a fucking Enzo or something that's like five million dollars, but otherwise a production car, you know, registered in Montana, it's like no, that guy. You see a Ferrari 812 mm-hmm. or an Aventador, that guy's evading taxes. That's what that's doing. Yeah, because those cars will pass. Um, uh, Chappie says for your Matt for your kitchen timer watch, can you use a dive watch and turn the bezel the other way? 
Uh, yes, you could you could make an, a, a, a a reverse bezel dive watch, but I want something with a, a chronograph, a start stop chronograph on it. So you could, I suppose, do a chronograph dive bezel that that where the 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 thing goes the other way, but that's not the spirit of what I want to do, Chappie. I want um, the next level in my watch design story is having a movement that does a cool thing, not just buying a movement from somebody. You feel me? That's our show, right? I feel you. That's our show. Two hours of radio today. That's what you get when it's raining. Let's see if this works again. Our, uh, our climate control in this room, it took a little poo earlier. That's why you might have heard some phone rings. Nope, it's still, still Fakakta. It, uh, I don't know why. It might be the rain, might be something something shorted out, I don't know, some fuse somewhere. No, no, no. But uh, that's why we had to podcast with the door open today, so you might have heard some phones ringing and shit in the background. Our bad. Time to call a person. Yeah. Tactile turn pens, available to the general public uh, as of today. Uh, find the link on, my, on our Instagram, the link in bio deal. Um, thank you to all the patrons who supported us by, uh, by buying those pens. They're really, really nice. I've been... Loving to uh, to write with them. And uh, go watch our videos, like, subscribe, do all that shit. And uh, do we have Johnny to- tomorrow, this week? Is that, oh, it might be next week. Johnny might be next week. Okay. We got more radio coming up with you later.